this is Dr. Susan Schultz with highlights for the month of April 2007. Please note that the full text of all articles may be viewed online at ajp.psychiatryonline.org, including all author affiliations and disclosures. We'll start with a report on Outcomes for Adolescents with Bipolar Disorder by Melissa Delbello and colleagues. This will be followed by an editorial by Boris Biermar. Then we'll turn to three articles on possible neurobiological markers for major depression. The first is increased waking salivary cortisol levels in young people at familial risk of depression by Zola Manny and colleagues. The second article is entitled, Neural Responses to Happy Facial Expressions in Major Depression Following Antidepressant Treatment. The authors are Cynthia Fu and colleagues. And the last in this group is Neural Evidence for Enhanced Error Detection in Major Depressive Disorder by Pearl Chu and colleagues. These will be followed by an editorial by Maria Oquendo, What Have We Learned About the Neurobiology of Major Depression? After the editorial, we'll discuss this month's Treatment in Psychiatry article, Lifting the Veil on Trichotillomania, by Samuel Chamberlain and colleagues. And finally, we'll highlight the Clinical Case Conference, A Genetic Etiology of Pervasive Developmental Disorder Guides Treatment, by Marjorie Solomon and colleagues. Our discussion begins with the article by Melissa Delbello and colleagues. 12-month outcome of adolescents with bipolar disorder following first hospitalization for a manic or mixed episode. Although the onset of bipolar disorder most commonly occurs during adolescence, there have been relatively few naturalistic outcome studies of children and adolescents with bipolar disorder. In addition, outcome studies of bipolar youth have not identified consistent predictors of recovery or recurrence and they have not distinguished among syndromic, symptomatic, and functional outcomes. The aim of this study was to investigate the 12-month outcome of bipolar adolescents following their initial hospitalization for a manic or mixed episode. Specifically, the study examined rates of syndromic, symptomatic, and functional recoveries as well as syndromic recurrence. A secondary aim of this study was to examine whether there are distinct predictors of these outcomes. The study participants were 71 adolescents who were assessed during their first hospitalization for a manic or mixed episode of bipolar disorder. They were also evaluated at 1, 4, 8, and 12 months after discharge from the hospital. Symptom severity was measured with a six-point scale that was based on the Young Mania Rating Scale, Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, and Scale for the Assessment of Positive Symptoms. Functioning was evaluated with the Functional Rating Scales of the Longitudinal Interval Follow-Up Examination, or LIFE. In the year after hospitalization, 85% of the adolescents experienced syndromic recovery. However, only 39% had symptomatic or functional recovery. Syndromic recovery was less likely for adolescents who did not take prescribed medication, had co-occurring attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or alcohol use disorder, or had low family socioeconomic status. Symptomatic recovery was only half as likely for girls as for boys. Psychosis was not predictive of any outcome measure. Of the 60 patients who had syndromic recovery, Half had at least one syndromic recurrence during the one-year follow-up. Recurrence was more common among patients who took antidepressants and those who abused alcohol. Recurrence was less common among those who received psychotherapy. The editorial by Boris Biermar is entitled, Longitudinal Course of Pediatric Bipolar Disorder. It discusses problems in diagnosis and identifies the numerous negative consequences of the disorder. It also outlines clinical implications of the Delbello study. The low rate of functional recovery and the time lag between the symptomatic and functional recoveries indicate the need for treatments that will increase the rate and speed of functional recovery.
Treatments are also needed to target other environmental factors, such as family psychopathology and child-specific factors, such as ADHD and cognitive style. Since substance abuse tends to develop after the onset of bipolar disorder, its early detection and prevention is important because of its deleterious effects on the course of bipolar disorder. An average of 10 years elapse before bipolar disorder is diagnosed and treatment begins. For each year of illness, youths with bipolar disorder have a 10% lower likelihood of recovery, which emphasizes the need for early recognition and treatment of children and adolescents to ameliorate symptoms and reduce the serious psychosocial morbidity that usually accompanies this illness. Unfortunately, a large proportion of patients do not adhere to pharmacological interventions and thus experience even more recurrences. Many children with bipolar disorder require multiple medications, which may negatively influence their own and their parents' willingness to continue treatment. Also, children and their families may discontinue the pharmacological treatment because of side effects, breakthrough of depression or mania, cost, or paradoxically, because the child is transiently doing well and they do not see a good reason to continue treatment. Thus, successful management requires thorough education, frequent communication with the child, the family, and teachers, easy accessibility to treatment, and appropriate and reasonable cost medical coverage. Also, successful treatment of comorbid disorders may improve adherence to treatment. In the Dobello study, antidepressants were associated with shorter times for syndromic recurrences. Although this finding is controversial, other studies have also shown increased recurrence with the use of antidepressants in patients with bipolar disorder. These findings, together with the small but clinically important finding that antidepressants may increase the risk for suicidal behaviors, indicate the need for caution with this type of medication for youths with bipolar disorder. However, antidepressants have not been used extensively in prospective, randomized controlled trials. In naturalistic studies, some of these medications may have been prescribed because the subjects were already depressed and thus were already at risk to manifest suicidal ideation. Interestingly, the DiBello results indicate that the use of psychotherapy for youths was accompanied by longer asymptomatic periods. Similar findings have been reported in studies of family-focused therapy in youth and adults. It is clear that comprehensive treatment planning that addresses the relapsing course of the illness and its comorbid factors, including other illnesses, family psychopathology, and traumatic events, is warranted. Outcomes to be assessed should include not only the symptoms, but also the child's cognitive development and social and coping skills. This concludes the highlights of the editorial by Boris Biermar. Please refer to the April issue for the full editorial and the Del Bello article. Next, we'll turn to the articles on biological markers of depression. They are discussed in the editorial by Maria Oquendo, entitled, What Have We Learned About the Neurobiology of Major Depression? She points out that the search for neurobiological markers for major depressive disorder has intensified as a new armamentarium of neurobiological and neurocognitive tools has driven investigations in recent years. Identification of neurobiological markers for major depression may elucidate its pathophysiology, lead to novel targets for its treatment, and aid in detecting persons at risk for developing the illness. Ultimately, the search is fueled by the hope that finding reliable neurobiological markers may support prevention of the morbidity and mortality associated with this debilitating recurrent condition. The April issue of the journal presents studies of three different putative neurobiological markers of major depressive disorder. The first study is increased waking salivary cortisol levels in young people at familial risk of depression by Zola Manny and colleagues. The Manny article reports on morning cortisol levels in the saliva of young adults and examines whether elevation of these levels is a trait marker for familial risk for major depression. The study participants were young adults who had never been depressed. Offspring of depressed parents were compared with subjects who had no parental history of depression, 
the salivary cortisol levels were higher in the offspring of depressed parents than in the offspring of non-depressed parents. The difference occurred on both workdays and non-workdays. Perhaps most striking, these differences in morning salivary cortisol were apparent even though the two groups did not differ in any detectable subclinical level of depression or anxiety. This finding suggests that the abnormality is an enduring trait abnormality rather than a reaction to lifetime stressors and events or a state marker for depression, as was postulated in the early 1980s. In addition to experimental issues such as the lack of direct observation of cortisol collection, the authors themselves identify limitations to their work, most notably the lack of direct interviews of the parents. Also missing is assessment of post-traumatic stress disorder, history of sexual abuse, and suicidal behavior, all of which are important factors that also influence hypothalamic pituitary adrenal functioning. The second article is Neural Responses to Happy Facial Expressions in Major Depression Following Antidepressant Treatment by Cynthia Fu and colleagues. It describes a potential state marker for major depressive disorder that may be detected as changes in neural activation during identification of the gender of happy faces. The subjects were instructed to identify the gender of faces shown to them while they were undergoing magnetic resonance imaging, but the imaging was actually used to determine the differences in the hemodynamic response to happy faces between depressed patients and healthy volunteers. The gender task instruction only ensured that the subjects paid attention to the faces. The subjects with major depression were slower and less accurate in the gender identification task. Also, the limbic, extrastriatal, and subcortical regions of their brains showed less change in activation in response to increasingly happy faces. Despite this deficit in dynamic response, the depressed participants' overall neuronal responsivity to happy faces, which the authors refer to as capacity, was not attenuated relative to the comparison subjects. After eight weeks of fluoxetine treatment, the capacity in the depressed subjects increased to above normal values. This increase in capacity correlated with improvement in symptoms as measured by the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. Thus, the effects of symptomatic improvement after eight weeks of fluoxetine appear somewhat different in character from the deficit in dynamic response among the depressed subjects observed at baseline. The authors note that this could be a nonspecific fluoxetine effect rather than the result of symptomatic improvement. Nonetheless, this provocative finding implies that it is not simply that depressed subjects are less responsive to happy stimuli. Rather, it suggests that they are selectively less reactive to more graded changes in positive stimuli in other people, and that this more subtle deficit does not normalize with treatment, even if the overall level of response is increased. The third article in this group is Neural Evidence for Enhanced Error Detection in Major Depressive Disorder by Pearl Chu and Patricia Delden. They report on two possible depressive state markers measured with electroencephalography. One measure is error-related negativity, an EEG wave that measures brain resources engaged in early error detection. The second is error positivity, a second EEG wave thought to reflect error detection, but this wave is similar when errors go undetected by the participant. Depressed and healthy subjects did not differ in response time or accuracy in the simple signal detection task used in this study. This suggests that the depressed patients did not have significant psychomotor retardation or concentration problems. However, EEG measurements of both error-related negativity and error positivity were exaggerated in the depressed participants. In other words, patients with major depression recruited more brain resources to detect errors. Moreover, negative reinforcement elicited more response than positive reinforcement in the depressed subjects, in contrast to the healthy comparison subjects. This suggests that persons with major depressive disorder are better at noticing their errors, which could be construed as a positive attribute but could also lead to devastating self-criticism.
each of these three articles is frank about the limitations of its findings. Are these limitations responsible for our field's long-standing struggle to identify the reliable neurobiological trait and state markers that we need? The limitations include the inability to measure a comprehensive set of markers in a large group of patients, the heterogeneity of depression itself, the inevitable presence of concomitant medication, and fatigue and habituation to the repeated testing that is needed to establish patients' responses before and after changes in their mood state. Additional limitations are misclassification of subjects as having or not having a disorder, the presence of comorbidity, admixture of medication-naive and treated participants, and stressors in youth or at the time of depression onset. All of these add to the observed instability of results from neurobiological studies of major depressive disorder. Moreover, many studies may be hampered by statistical problems such as low power or insufficient data to determine that a difference is present, as well as multiple comparisons potentially leading to reports of differences that may be due to chance. Finally, because these are new findings, replication is necessary before we can be sure to what extent these findings are valid for most patients with depressive disorders. What can clinicians find in these studies to use in the treatment of depressed patients? Often patients tell us that they feel stressed under circumstances in which others do not, that they are less reactive to friendly people around them than they want to be, and that they are hypercritical. These three studies are evidence that such characteristics, which the patients may view as personal failings, are instead deeply rooted in their brain's biology. Reconceptualizing the nature of their negative cognitive behavioral self-image may bring them some relief from their discouragement with themselves and help reopen the possibility of therapeutic change. We hope that all groups seeking neurobiological markers for major depressive disorder and other psychiatric conditions will do so with an eye toward developing highly sensitive and selective tests that can be widely accessed from the clinic. This concludes the highlights of the editorial by Maria Oquendo. Please refer to the April issue for the full editorial and the three articles it covers. Now we'll turn to the Treatment in Psychiatry article, Lifting the Veil on Trichotillomania by Samuel Chamberlain and colleagues. The article begins with a hypothetical case report. Dr. D. is a 32-year-old general practitioner. She presented to a psychiatric referral clinic with a history of repetitive hair pulling since age 14. Recently, the hair pulling had escalated, and it now occupied two to three hours per day. Despite imaginative efforts to conceal her missing hair and eyebrows, Dr. D. felt that she was fighting a losing battle. She reported an overpowering urge to touch, select, and pull out particular hairs, and described feelings of tension that were alleviated only by the act of hair pulling. This behavior had led to a growing sense of frustration and shame and the avoidance of social contact. Trichotillomania is poorly understood. It is typically confined to one or two sites. It most frequently affects the scalp, but can also involve the eyelashes, eyebrows, pubic hair, body hair, and facial hair. Patients tend to be highly secretive about the condition and to regard their behavior as shameful. Many hair pullers also exhibit additional stereotypic movements, such as nail biting, knuckle cracking, touching or playing with pulled hair, and hair eating. Along with the cosmetic and psychosocial consequences of the disorder, medical complications can occur, including infection, permanent loss of hair, repetitive stress injury, carpal tunnel syndrome, and gastrointestinal obstruction. There have been no population-wide epidemiological studies of trichotillomania. In a survey of 2,500 college students, lifetime prevalence was estimated at 0.6% when strict criteria were used. It is frequently linked with other conditions, notably mood and anxiety disorders. In adult recruitment studies, female participants have typically outnumbered males by at least three to one. Hair pulling and related grooming phenomena frequently occur in family members of patients with trichotillomania. It is probable that multiple genes confer biological vulnerability. In some cases, there is an apparent etiological role for stress Hair pulling can be seen as a soothing behavior that is driven by rising tension. 
trichotillomania appears similar to obsessive compulsive disorder, but hair pulling is usually driven by increasing psychological tension rather than by obsessions. Its epidemiology, brain and neuropsychological dysfunction, and comorbidity also distinguish it from obsessive compulsive disorder. There have been few well designed clinical trials. Some findings suggest that behavioral therapies have benefits. Clomipramine has led to improvements in some comparisons, but fluoxetine has not. Dual therapy with both drug and behavioral treatments may work best for certain patients. The authors advise clinicians to be vigilant when patients present with inappropriate or unusual head coverings. Patients with trichotillomania actively disguise the signs and symptoms of their illness to avoid disclosure. Assessment requires great clinical sensitivity, as hair pulling can also affect other sites on the body, including the pubic region, and patients frequently regard their behavior as shameful. A classic faux pas is to rush in and ask to examine the affected sites without first taking care to establish rapport and trust. Clinicians should also bear in mind that trichotillomania frequently coexists with concurrent depression and anxiety disorders. Moreover, given the similarities between trichotillomania and other obsessive-compulsive spectrum disorders, careful screening is necessary to ensure accurate diagnosis. Treatment selection is likely to depend largely on the patient's choice, given the limited clinical research evidence. No formal treatment algorithm for trichotillomania can be formulated, and it is important to make patients aware of this. In addition to drug treatment and psychotherapy, educational materials and support websites can also be therapeutic. Next, we'll turn to an actual patient history presented by Marjorie Solomon and colleagues in their clinical case conference, A Genetic Etiology of Pervasive Developmental Disorder Guides Treatment. The patient is referred to as Lisa. She was referred for the author's clinic for a multidisciplinary evaluation when she was nine years old. Her parents reported that she had long-standing socialization, learning, and behavior problems, and a high level of anxiety. She was described as a bubbly girl. However, when faced with cognitive or social challenges, she exhibited tantrums, aggression, and self-injury. She had no true friends. Her academic performance was in the low to average range, and she had particular difficulties with mathematics. Special education and speech therapy had been moderately effective. Her family was becoming increasingly worried as the gap in social and academic functioning between Lisa and her peers was widening. At home, Lisa was hyperactive, distractible, and impulsive, and moved from activity to activity. When task demands exceeded her level of competence, she would shout and become highly agitated. Her mother also reported that Lisa did not initiate interactions with other children and became overwhelmed during group activities. Her leisure interests included reading, playing alone outdoors, and helping her father. Lisa had been diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. She had a full-scale IQ of 72, but her verbal IQ was 83. She performed significantly better on verbal measures than on perceptual and organizational tests. She demonstrated strengths on subtests reflecting information and vocabulary. In contrast, her abstract verbal reasoning and arithmetic performance were relative weaknesses. Evaluation of her perceptual motor integration skills suggested a developmental delay in the acquisition of eye-hand coordination. The author's multidisciplinary evaluation also revealed physical anomalies and symptoms of autism. Lisa was referred for high-resolution cytogenetic and fragile X syndrome DNA testing. The results documented a full mutation of the fragile X mental retardation 1 gene, and Lisa was subsequently diagnosed with fragile X syndrome. This is the most common form of inherited mental retardation but in females it usually causes learning disabilities. The behavioral phenotype of Fragile X syndrome includes anxiety, hyperarousal, problems with attention and executive functioning, and symptoms of pervasive developmental disorder. The authors devised a treatment plan that incorporated best practices for individuals with autism spectrum disorders, but was tailored for an individual with Fragile X syndrome.
Starting with the knowledge of the phenotype for Fragile X syndrome, the case formulation began with a hypothesis that many of Lisa's behavioral and social problems stemmed from hyperarousal and anxiety. Because these symptoms are phenotypic features of Fragile X syndrome, they were treated first. Psychopharmacological treatment included an SSRI for anxiety, a psychostimulant for symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and an atypical antipsychotic for mood instability. Her academic environment was adapted to capitalize on her strengths and mitigate her weaknesses. Children with her cognitive profile exhibit excellent memories for facts and rote information, especially when it is delivered verbally, but they display problems with abstract reasoning. They are concrete in their interpretations of language and require very deliberate and clear instructions. Lisa's teachers were informed about the nonverbal learning disability and Fragile X syndrome and were given suggestions about how to capitalize on her academic strengths. It was also recommended that Lisa participate in a social skills group. This activity would teach skills related to emotional understanding and awareness, perspective taking, stress and anger management, conversations, friendships, and problem solving. The authors point out the importance of genetic testing for Fragile X syndrome in girls who have borderline to normal IQ and autism spectrum symptoms. Fragile X syndrome is typically considered a mental retardation syndrome with a greater effect in males. However, because females have two X chromosomes, production of the protein associated with the Fragile X mental retardation 1 gene is maintained to varying degrees by the presence of the unaffected X chromosome. Thus, females can appear with cognitive abilities ranging from mental retardation to normal or even higher than average IQ. The American College of Medical Genetics policy statement on Fragile X syndrome states that individuals of either sex who have mental retardation, developmental delay, or autism, especially when associated with other physical and behavioral characteristics of Fragile X syndrome, a family history of it, or a relative with undiagnosed mental retardation, should be tested for the Fragile X mental retardation 1 gene mutation. Currently, it is estimated that approximately 15% of the cases of autism spectrum disorder may have a known genetic etiology. Psychiatrists are also urged to pay close attention to girls with symptoms of pervasive developmental disorder because although four times as many boys are thought to be affected with autism spectrum disorders, some have cautioned that girls escape detection because of their milder symptom presentation or because of gender biases. The identification of the genetic etiology of Lisa's clinical symptoms had important implications for her treatment. Anxiety and hyperarousal are more prominent in Fragile X syndrome than in autism. Also, mathematical reasoning is not necessarily affected in individuals with autism. Furthermore, we know that individuals with Fragile X syndrome have impaired sensory motor gating and increased sympathetic responses to sensory stimuli. The evidence for sensory issues in idiopathic pervasive developmental disorder is mixed, whereas it is clear and consistent in Fragile X syndrome. Another point of differentiation regards the nature of problems with social gaze. In autism, the cause of gaze abnormalities is poorly understood, but in Fragile X syndrome, it is most often related to anxiety and stress. This concludes the audio highlights of the April issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. We invite you to refer to the online issue at ajp.psychiatryonline.org for the full text of these and other articles. Thank you.